Good evening. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to the book of First Peter. And as we continue in our study, we've come to we've come to a change in our outline. If you remember, we've been going through over the past few weeks God's grace in submission. And we've been learning how to submit. And it started out, the entire book is about God's grace. And it started out talking about in chapter 1 how we were chosen for grace and how the first aspect of God's grace that we have is his salvation and the salvation that we have through election and, and what goes on through that and then the hope that we have through salvation and the holiness and the love that we have in salvation. And then Peter changed his tune just a little bit and he explained to us this idea that we have to, that because we have salvation, because God has marked us out with this grace unto salvation, we should submit to him, to the people around us in love. And now he comes to this last section, chapter 3 through chapter 5, chapter 3, verse 13 through chapter 5. And he talks about probably one of the most difficult subjects to talk about in North America today, and that is suffering. That if you have been given God's grace, if you have attained, you've been chosen for his grace, if you have been given through that grace salvation, if you have, because of that grace, submitted your heart to Christ, then therefore you should understand a couple of things. That you are going to have hardships in life, you are going to have suffering in life, and you're going to be persecuted for Christ's sake in life. These are to be understood at, this, at the outset. But God is with you, and even in suffering, you will continue to have, guess what? Grace. And I think that this is one of the most difficult things to talk about in North America, because we have been convinced by the powers that be, and the people around us, and the media, that the object of life, your focus and purpose, should be happiness, entertainment, and complete and utter lack of any want in your life. That's why nowadays you don't have to wait. You don't even, back in the day, you had to order through Sears and Roebuck catalog and you would mail in your order and then you would wait months for it to arrive on your door. Now you can have it the same day, the same day shipping and they have all this other stuff and they're constantly looking for faster ways to get you what you want so you can have it now. You have to wait for anything. You don't have to wait for anything in life. And today, there is an escalating hostility towards Christianity throughout all Western culture. In Europe and in the United States and in other places, we see this escalation. And the roots of that hostility go back decades, even centuries. But the famous historian Francis Schaeffer, he provided this following analysis. In 1970, he said this, okay? 1970 is a long time ago. For those of you who don't remember, it's 45 years ago. Okay? And 45 years ago, almost half a century ago, for those of you who are counting, think about that. If you're 45, you're a half a century old. Right? That's where you're going with this. Some of you have been denying the fact that you're getting older, but if you're 45, you're almost a half a century, just so you realize that. He said this, In ancient Israel... When the nation had turned from God and from his truth and commands as given in scripture, the prophet Jeremiah cried out that there was death in the city. Now he was speaking not only of the physical death in Jerusalem, but also a wider death. Because Jewish society of that day had turned away from what God had given them in the scripture, there was death in the police. That is, death in the total culture and in the total society. So this is his first thing, that when they turned from God, it wasn't just physical death that was coming their way that Jeremiah was proclaiming, but death in the actual society of their culture, of their ethics. And he goes on to say this, in our era, sociolo sociologically, man destroyed the base which gave him the possibility of freedom without chaos. You see, God is the base of what? Freedom without chaos. God's love says you are free indeed, but you are free to love and that you are free to follow the Lord. You're not free to murder. You're not free to covet. You're not free to be immoral. You're not free to be evil because then they would have what? 
Complete freedom without regulation is chaos. But God's freedom is only regulated by what? Law, against which there is no law. Uh, he's regulated by love, which against there is no law. And God says, be free to do anything you want in love. Not to murder, not to destroy, not to kill, not to steal, not to covet, not to be immoral, but anything in love, anything that puts your neighbor above yourself, anything that helps the entire society. And he goes on to say this. And it's interesting, he says, so the sociologi sociologists have destroyed man by removing the Bible and the foundation of our nation, and they brought us utter chaos. Everyone does what's right in his own eyes, and there's utter chaos. And then he says this, humanists have been determined to beat to death the knowledge of God, and the knowledge of God has been not been silent but is spoken in the Bible and through Christ. And they have been determined to do this even though the death of values has come with the death of that knowledge. So our society has lost what? Values. We now murder unborn children and we murder the elderly and, and we just call it, you know, putting them out of their misery and not bringing them into this world or a woman's choice or whatever you want to call it. And we see two effects, he goes on to say, of our loss of meaning and values. The first is degeneracy. Think of the New York City Times Square, 42nd and Broadway. If one goes to what used to be the lovely Coverstrat of Amsterdam, one finds that it too has become equally squalid. The same is true of lovely old streets in Copenhagen. Pompeii has returned. The marks of ancient Rome scar us. Degeneracy, decadence, depravity. A love of violence for violence's sake. The situation is plain. If we look, we see it. If we see it, we are concerned. But, there, but we must notice that there is a second result of modern man's loss of meaning and values, which is more ominous, and which many people do not see. This second result is that the elite will exist. Society cannot stand chaos. Some group or some person will fill the vacuum. An elite will offer us arbitrary absolutes, and who will stand in its way? And so, 45 years ago, Philip Schaefer described our exact condition today. No morals, no values, an elite group of, of very, a very small elite group that run everything and tell us exactly what we should want, think, or do. There's a lack of equality. We see our entire nation has died. Our entire nation has died. And that's a very sad place. Now, believers in Peter's time, they lived in the Roman Empire that Schaefer referred to. They lived in this place facing all of the same kind of degeneracy and depravity and, and the oppression that assaults today's church. You see, I think a lot of times the church has been so quiet because there's no physical violence against the church. Well, at least there hasn't been much up until now. And so we've remained quiet and we haven't spoken and we haven't defended and we haven't stood up for the gospel. We've been so quiet in our churches, in our pews, hoping that they wouldn't notice us. And now our nation has died. It's in cardiac arrest. There are no morals. There are no values. We see our entire system collapsing around us. The people in, in Paul's and Peter's time faced much more frequent and overt hostility and persecution than believers in today's culture do in North America. But that's not to say that it's going to remain the same. That's not to say that our society is not going to change. Every day our society is more and more hostile towards Christians in the workplace, in the laws that they pass. There was a church this week that was given, the actual church was, was given a notice to appear before the court and they threatened to arrest the pastor because they were using microphones at their church service. At 9 o'clock in the morning, they turned on their microphones and they used their microphones and the sheriff decided to come out and tell them that they couldn't. While the next door neighbor was mowing his lawn with a very loud lawnmower, they couldn't use microphones at a reasonable level for a church service. You're starting to see more and more pastors, more and more churches affected by this lack of morals and values. As that happens, what happens to us, the Christians? I'm not here tonight to talk about what we need to do to stop this. That's a very simple, although complicated, answer. 
the answer is to share Jesus with everybody. That is the answer, is evangelism. Just so you know, the way to fix America is not to bomb abortion clinics, and it's not to kick the terrorists out. It's to evangelize everybody. What would happen to ISIS if we started evangelizing every terrorist that came over here and they started getting saved? They'd stop sending people. Why? Because, well, they're getting saved. and we're, we're sending them into the enemy and they're getting saved. That's not working. Let's try something else. But we're not doing that. We're not evangelizing. We're not stepping outside of our comfort zone and revealing the love that Christ has in us to others. But we'll save that for another time. The thing I want to talk about tonight is that we need to prepare our hearts and we need to prepare our spirits for suffering. You are going to suffer. It is going to happen. It is coming quicker than you think. And it's coming to your doorstep. It's coming to your home, to your school, to our church. It's coming to our city. It's coming to our state. And it is definitely coming to our nation. The enemy is at the door. And there will be suffering for following after Christ. As you've heard of the people who have been murdered and crucified, beheaded, set on fire, and burned alive in cages by ISIS because they were Christians, it is coming to us. And for whatever, in whichever way and however gr uh, detailed or difficult it is, suffering is coming. And so Peter writes to a group of people he knew was going to suffer. He's not blaming them for their suffering. He's not telling them that they didn't do what was right. He is simply stating that when it happens, you need to be prepared. You need to be ready for it, and you need to endure. And so tonight, we're going to see five principles that the believer needs to follow to embrace in order to equip and defend themselves against the threats of this unbelieving, hostile world. And there's five things that we're going to look at. And the first one is here in verse 13. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good. And I want you to write on that first line of your outline tonight, a passion for goodness. A passion for goodness. Notice what he says here. Who is he who will harm you? It's a rhetorical question. He's saying, is there anybody that can possibly do you any harm if you become followers of what is good? Now, there's two ways to look at this, this verse. First of all, his rhetorical question shows us that most people, most, I should say, reasonable people, even those who are hostile towards Christianity, will rarely harm believers who prove zealous for good work. So if you work at an orphanage, or if you work at, at a soup kitchen, or if you pass out clothes to the homeless in L.A., or whatever it is, normally, even if they don't believe in Jesus, they're going to help you or not hinder you in your labors to do what is good. I remember serving in Nicaragua as a missionary. It was a communist nation. The communists were in control. And we had a radio station and a Bible college. And we had a youth center. And we used to run an orphanage. And all of these things that we did, we were just known as being zealous for helping others out, not building big mansions for ourselves. And so even the communists would help us in the ministry because they saw that it was for the benefit of their entire city. So even those who are vehemently opposed to the gospel will sometimes give you what? They will give you a little bit of room if you are what? Focused on what is good. Now he uses the word here, if you become followers of what is good. Now the word followers here in the New King James is not, I don't think, it's a very accurate word. In the old King James, I like what he writes. He writes, if you become zealous for good works. That's the translation there. And the word here is specifically a word which means that we would prove, number one, which means to become. We, we are the embodiment of, we are actually the proof. It's not just that we, we try to prove it with our words. We are the truth. We become zealous. That word zealous just means intensity and enthusiasm. Okay? It's zealous that we need to become. Zealous of the Lord and what he's doing. And it really just describes a person with great 
desire for a specific cause. And he goes on to here to say, you know, it, you need to become, you need to be the embodiment of what? Of being excited and focused on good works. Now, the zealots were a group of people at the time of Peter and at the time of Jesus that were really hardcore. It would be what we would call insurgents today. We've talked a little bit about them in the past. And basically, it was a political party of patriots. Okay? And they were a lot like the way the first colonists were in America. In the sense that you had the British Empire here in the United States, here in, in the Americas, as they called them back then. And you had these colonies, and the colonists were being ruled by a tyrant thousands of miles away. And so this occupying force, the Brits... We're here, and the colonists decided that they were going to rise up covertly and just destroy their control over us. And the only difference between the zealots of America and the zealots of the Jews was that we won. We were the first nation to actually kick out the British Empire. We were the first ones to defeat them at their own game and run them off. And ever since, they've been, well, small. It was just a domino effect that ricocheted throughout the entire world. It was interesting that... But the, I, the same idea, you know, every zealot thinks he's correct. Every zealot thinks he's right, don't they? Think about ISIS. They would be the new zealots, aren't they? Aren't they just emphatic about their cause? They'll die for their cause. They'll blow themselves up for their cause. They'll face certain death because they don't care. This is the same intensity that he's calling us to have. So what's the difference between ISIS and Christianity in this sense? And he's very clear that we are zealous for what? Good works. Think of how zealous ISIS is today in the world. How, over, how, how overt they are. How public they are about it. How passionate they are about evil and wickedness. Murder and hate and injustice and thievery and covetousness and all of these things which is very prominent in ISIS that they would be doing there where they're at. And then you look at what Christians are doing for good. Do we meet that same standard of enthusiasm for good as they have toward evil? That, my friends, is a very, very difficult question. Am I that zealous for what's good? Am I that passionate about helping people and doing what's right? Because if you have a passion for goodness, and you should write that on that first line if you haven't done so already, a passion for goodness will prepare you for hardships and suffering. Why? Because the world has a tendency not to punish those who are extremely passionate about good things, about love. We've had in our nation a lot of people who get fired for being a Christian, but I got to tell you, if you're the best employee in the company and you're asking for Sundays off to go to church, they probably might give you leniency, wouldn't they? Compared to if you're just a mediocre employee who kind of, eh, whatever. <laughs> Great, I, got an, I have an excuse to fire you now or to run you out of the company. You're going to have to quit because I'm not going to give in. I can finally get rid of you. See, you don't want that to be the response. You want to be the best employee that they have, that they don't want to lose. Then maybe when you ask for the day off for, to go to church, they're going to say, yeah, absolutely, I don't mind. You make up for it on Monday through Saturday. You don't want to be the person who's always failing in life and failing at being good towards others. Goodness is what he says here. It's very specific. And I want to challenge you to have a passion for goodness. And it, it's really just this idea that you would become the embodiment, the proof of what is good. That your life would be the ruler that they would measure goodness by. Now, of course, being zealous for what is good produces what? A godly life, doesn't it? So this is, regardless of what is going to happen with your suffering, we should have this passion for goodness. To be a delight to other people around us, which leads to pure living and really a loss of appetite for the world's ungodly actions and attractions. Because when you have such a desire for goodness, you don't want the things of the world. They don't matter to you anymore. But he goes on to say this in verse 14. So prepare yourself with goodness, a passion for goodness. But then he says in number two, there in verse 14, you need to have a willingness to suffer. Write that on that next line. I know you're thinking that I'm crazy. 
you need to have a willingness to suffer. Notice what he says. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. You know, there's a lot of people who want to avoid suffering at all costs. And that is why I have met many women who have gotten their tubes tied in their teens or their early 20s because they were desperate to never get pregnant. Do you know why? They didn't want to go through the pain of childbirth. That was the reason. They never wanted to have kids because they thought it would hurt. I want you to think about that for just a minute. Yes, they missed out on a little bit of pain. They missed out on a little bit of suffering. But in the end, they missed out on all of the blessings that they were going to have in their life because of their children. Because children are an inheritance from the Lord. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them, the Bible says. Yet the world has turned it on its head and said that children are just a burden and they're expensive. I got to tell you, I have to tell you, I have six. And we were out at a restaurant and we kept having people count. Are they all yours? Yep. All of them. They're ours. How many girls? All but one. Why do you have... Are you Mormons? No, we're not Mormon. Why does everybody think that we're Mormon? <laughs> this year we put Christmas tree lights up on the house so that people wouldn't realize, they would realize we're not Mormon. All the neighbors know now. You know, there's a lot of people, and why is it that only Mormons have a lot of kids? Why is it that people don't understand that children are an inheritance? But then there's a lot of people, out oh, I don't want to have kids. I don't want to lose my figure. All right. How many of you realize that good things are worth suffering for? Anybody know this? Right? Good things come to those who wait, is the old saying. But working hard and going without sleep, and sweating and toiling with your hands can produce awesome things, can't it? How many of you have ever had a goal that you wanted to reach? Or you've had, you've had something that you wanted to achieve in life, and so what did you do? Maybe, maybe you had this goal that you wanted to achieve of a certain weight or a certain figure, and so you worked out every day, you ate right, and you suffered through that time, but in the end, you gained what? The physique that you wanted, or the look that you wanted, or whatever it is. Or maybe you wanted to learn how to play an instrument, and so your fingers, they start, I don't know, I, I, you can't see them from there, but my fingers have indentions for my guitar strings because of the calluses, and they just, they fit in there. And when your fingers don't have those calluses, you know what happens to your fingers? They hurt. It's a, it's a terrible, painful thing. That it goes on in your fingertips because they hurt. And you know what? If you keep at it, you keep playing your instrument every day, you practice, you focus, guess what happens over time? You gain a skill. Guess what happens if you're faithful with your finances and you don't blow all your money on silly things, you put it into your savings account, you do what's right, you invest it wisely, what happens in time? You multiply your finances and you can buy the house or the car or whatever it was that you wanted and have nice things if you do what's right, but it, you're going to suffer now by not being able to go out all the time or not go bowling every, every third day or, or not eat out at every restaurant that everybody else goes to or see every new movie that's in the movie theater because you are striving and suffering for something else that's going to come. In order to achieve greatness in any cause, you have to be willing to suffer. That's just all there is to it. In order to achieve the bliss of retirement, you have to suffer through what? Work, don't you? And how many of you couples could say that the latter end of marriage is much gr better than the beginning of marriage? Some of you can raise your hands. Some of you should raise your hands. You know, there's a time in marriage when you first get married that there's a honeymoon period which lasts in between six weeks and 12 months. And then... There's the middle, which lasts about 40 years. And then there's the blissful age after, you know, after you both are kind of growing older and after menopause and after the midlife crisis for the guy and after all this stuff, you get to this place and every couple I've ever asked who's been married that long, who's gotten into that phase, has always told me it's the best phase of marriage. The end. And I've seen couples who get divorced after 10, 15, 20 years of marriage. 
and they, they're right at the finish line and they, they fall out. They miss it. They don't make it. Why? Because they don't want or they're not willing to suffer through that little bit for the best part. They're not willing to go through that trial, that persecution. Any race that's worth winning or worth finishing, you have to suffer through the pain of running it. And I want to challenge you that you have to realize, and he says here, don't be troubled by the threat of suffering. Don't be freaked out. Don't think I've got to get out of suffering. That's not the case. Sometimes we are called to suffer, and we have to be willing to go through that, just like every mom has to be willing to not just go through the childbirth. Let me just explain something to you. Childbirth is the beginning of sorrows. When you have kids, it is the beginning of the pain. It doesn't get any easier from that crying ball of flesh that comes out of you after 30 hours of labor. It gets harder after that. I'm going to tell you, it's going to be hard for about 20 years. Okay? Maybe 30, depending on how your parenting skills are. But sooner than later, you're going to have some awesome fellowship with your kids. If you stick with it, and if you dedicate yourself, and you suffer a little bit, and you deal with the lack of finances and all this other stuff, dads, if you spend time with your sons now and your daughters now, when they're in their teens, and you're going hunting with them, and you're doing things with them, and you're spending time with them, that's the best time. My wife is always like, how come you're not so involved with the little babies? I'm like, they don't do anything. I'm not equipped to take care of them. But when they're in their toddlers, and then they're a little bit older, then we go do things, and we enjoy ourselves, and then when they're... In, when they finally have their kids, if you've maintained that good relationship with them, what happens? Now they're bringing over the grandkids. Now they're bringing over the, you're spending better time with them and you're helping them and you're getting fulfilled through what's going on. And it's, you fill them with candy, you send them home with mom and dad. And all of a sudden you get to the sweet part. But how many grandparents have I met that they miss out on that great part because they didn't maintain a good relationship with their kid. When the kids are going through their teenage years, they blew it. They mess it up. They wrote off their kids, and they, they walked away from them, and now they don't know their own grandchildren because they weren't willing to suffer through the hard part to get to the good part. You have to have a willingness to suffer. You have to be willing to say, God, I will endure all things. That's why the Bible says, what? That you need to endure until the end. Blessed are those who endure until the end. And do not grow weary while doing good. For you shall reap if you do not lose heart. So if you are going through trials or tribulations in life, if you're going through suffering of any kind, then you endure until the end. You keep focused on the prize and you watch God do some amazing things. If you tap out now, you can go and get an abortion now, and you will regret it for the rest of your life. You can go ahead and write off your family now, and you can go ahead and write off your friends now. You can quit your job because it's too hard now, and you'll never grow, and you'll never achieve great things. Or you can endure and see God's greatness in yourself. He goes on to say this in verse 15. So he starts with saying, have a passion for goodness, and then have a willingness to suffer and then number in verse 15, have a devoted heart. And you can write that on that line there. He says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Now this word here, sanctify Christ, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, it should be translated, sanctify Christ as Lord. Now the word sanctify just means to set apart or consecrate. And in this context, it, gives, it means give the primary place of adoration. Make Jesus number one. Believers who sanctify Christ in their hearts are setting him apart from everything else in their life as the sole object of their love and of their reverence, of their loyalty and of their obedience. Jesus is number one in their life. They recognize his perfection. They magnify his glory. They extol his preeminence. They submit themselves to his will at all times with the understanding that sometimes submission includes what? Suffering. How many times did your parents tell you to do something that you didn't want to do and it meant that you couldn't go to a party or that you had to lose a friend or you had to not do something that you wanted to do? And sometimes obedience requires what? I wouldn't say necessarily suffering if you think about all the blessings of obedience, but at the same time, God, he, he understands our tedious hearts. 
We have to have a devoted heart to Christ. One of the problems in society today is that we're not devoted to Christ. We're devoted to whatever whim attaches itself to our spirit. We're devoted to any passing moment, any fleeting issue that comes across our lives. And so whatever thing is going on today, that's what we're devoted to. And we're very, well, we're very finicky people. But the Bible says, don't ask, don't go before the Lord in doubting. Don't go before the Lord finicky. We go before him, what? Steadfastly in faith. And I think a lot of times that the reason that we're so finicky and that we're moved so easily from one thing to the next is that we're not wholly dedicated to Christ. We've not devoted our hearts to him. Christ must be the most important thing in your life. When you wake up in the morning, it's to serve him. When you go to work every day, it's to fulfill his law and his mercy and his love. When you come home every day, it's to, it's to prepare your family in his love. When you rest at night, it's to prepare for the next day. When you read his word, it's that you would know him. When Christ controls your life, you'll always have an answer when people ask about this hope that you have in him. They're going to ask you, they're going to say, hey, what's the matter with that guy? What's going on with him? When you make Jesus your all, then you'll have an answer for people who ask about the hope that you have in Christ. See, this honoring of Christ is not external. It's in your heart. Notice what he says. Sanctify Jesus as Lord in your heart. Not just wear a Christian t-shirt or slap a bumper sticker on your car. Even when you have to face unjust suffering, you focus on Jesus. That submission and trust in Christ is in always, but it starts here. It starts in your heart. A surrendered heart and a good conscience go together. And a lot of times, people will not fal falsely accuse you if you have those two things. But if they do, then you'll be able to withstand it. At the end of verse 15, he says something else that I, I find important. He says, you need to have a passion for goodness, a willingness to suffer, a devoted heart to Christ, but also a willingness to defend. And I want you to write that on that next line there, a willingness to defend. What does he say? And always be ready to give a defense, literally an apologia or an apologetics, to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so what he says here is that he wants you to defend the gospel, but this is not the, the kind of defense that Peter had in mind when Jesus was being taken. If you remember, it was the writer of this book who was holding the sword when they came for Jesus. And what did he do? He cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. And Jesus said, Peter, put your sword away. Now, I find it interesting that it was Jesus that told Peter to take the sword. He said, do you guys have any swords? And they had, yeah, we have three. All right, that's enough. And they left. So Peter's carrying the sword that Jesus reminded him to take. And when it came time to use it, Jesus said, no, Peter, I wanted to test if you could not use it. Put it away. And he puts the guy's ear on. And he heals his ear. And the servant of the high priest still delivered Jesus to be tried. After his ear was healed by Jesus. And so here is Peter, the same guy who is using the sword, and he's saying, that's not the defense that we want. This, this word apologia in Greek is, the, is a word for standing before a court and giving your defense. Why am I guilty or innocent? And here he says, always. What does that mean? We need to be constantly prepared and ready to respond whether in a formal courtroom or informally to anybody who asks you, hey, man, what's going on in your life? Why are you always so happy anyway? What's the matter with you? I went to a funeral this morning, and my kids are all smiles and happy, and it's really hard to keep a kid not happy. at a, and You're supposed to, at a funeral, you're supposed to be very ominous and somber, and, and you don't clap, and they had a number of performances that went on. And you're not supposed to clap. You're not supposed to do anything. You're supposed to sit there and be very somber. And my kids are just, hi, you know. Now, if an adult was there doing that, someone's going to come up to them and say, you're not normal. What's the matter with you? That should be how you look in the crowd, in the world. They should come up to you and say, you're not normal. 
What's the matter with you? They should see something different about you, a hope and a joy that nobody else has. I've been picking on you for years and you still haven't cracked. What's the matter with you? And now you're ready to give your defense, your apologia. Now our defense is the defense of our hope that we have in salvation. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified that gives us this joy and this hope. And how are we supposed to give it? Well, he says here, with meekness and fear. Meekness is just gentleness. And fear is really reverence. A regard for God, a regard for the person that you're talking to. I've, I've seen people on YouTube and other places where they sit there and they argue and they, they, they call it uh, the apologetic smackdown and all kinds of stuff on YouTube. And you see these guys talking and they're arguing and all this other stuff. That's not what he's talking about here. So all of you people who love to argue, this is not it. That's not what he's calling you to do. I used to be that guy, just so you know. I used to love to study apologetics. You know why? I used to like to have an answer for everything. And then I used to like to pick fights, find somebody. I remember in Nicaragua, we had the Seventh Day, uh, no, we had, um, it wasn't Seventh Day Adventist, it was um, Apostolics came over. And then the Jehovah's Witnesses came over right after them. And the Apostolic Church had gotten me going. And then the Jehovah's Witnesses, same day, showed up, and there was this little 90-year-old lady and her granddaughter. Poor people. <coughs> Came to my door. I argued with them for the better part of an hour and a half. And I think they were questioning whether or not Jesus was real at the end of that because they were just, they couldn't answer anything I had to say. And man, I, I had an answer for everything. Told them that their church was, a, you know, a bunch of blasphemers. I, I was all over it. Finally, the ringleader of all the group that was around the park came over to our house. And he said, you have a good day. And they all walked off. Didn't realize he was the guy who drove the trash truck. And for a decade, they didn't pick up our trash at our facility. No joke, 10 years. They didn't come, and th they had a tractor and a little trailer that they pulled and they would pick up trash around town. They never stopped at our facility for 10 years. We had to pay 20 bucks a week to have somebody else come in their truck and pick it up for us and take it out to the dump. Don't do that, folks. You will cause yourself more harm than good if you become that guy who's just arguing with everybody. Be ready to give a defense. In what way? In meekness and fear. The Bible says, speak the truth, but in love. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I'm just telling it how it is. No, you're not. You're telling it how you perceive it to be. Speak in love. That's how it is. God is love. And God loved you and had grace on you. And he didn't stick it to you. And he didn't argue with you when you were in the world. He was patient and kind, gentle, peaceable, long-suffering with you. And that is the attitude that we must have as we give our defense. Not arguing. I don't have to argue. My life speaks for itself. If you really want to know what's going on in my heart, I'll tell you. If you're just trying to provoke a, an argument, just watch my life then, and that's okay. So I challenge you to watch my life is what you should tell people. If they just want to argue, don't argue with your coworkers. Don't create a big stink. Don't, don't try to slam them with the gospel. That's not going to save anybody. But sharing with them, you know, I have Jesus in my heart. Oh, you Jesus freaks. Yep, it's exactly why you're asking me about my joy. You want to hear more about it? Let me know. But you know what? That's what you're missing. That's what you're looking for. That's what you're noticing is Jesus. Finally, the last thing is in verse 16. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ might be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. The last thing I want you to write is a pure conscience. The conscience is this divinely placed internal mechanism that either accuses or excuses a person. It's a means of conviction or affirmation. And a good conscience is what we must keep, or I think it's better spoken, we must maintain. Because the eyes of man are, the ways of man are right in his own eyes. How many of you do what you think is right? How many of you found out what you thought was right was actually wrong? Anybody ever find that out? So here's the problem. Your conscience, don't let it be your guide. Okay, Geppetto was wrong. He's evil. Look at where Pinocchio got following his conscience, okay? 
a whale, slavery, all this other stuff. We teach kids to follow their conscience. Well, do what you think is right. Don't do what you think is right. Do what you know is right. A lot of times throughout the day, we make decisions based on our conscience. How many of you do that? You make decisions based on your conscience, right? Because what you think is right, what you think is wrong, will determine what you're going to do and how it'll influence your choices. So what I believe that we need to do is that we need to maintain our conscience. Now, how do you do that? By continually instructing yourself in what is right and what is wrong. What did God say about the matter in Joshua chapter 1, verse 6 through 9? He says, Have I not commanded you be strong and very courageous? Only let this word of my law not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, and observe to do all that is written in it. And then you shall have good success, and, you, and your path shall be made straight. The idea here is that you need to maintain a proper lifestyle of reading God's word and applying it to your life, and then your conscience will become pure. Just because you feel that it's good doesn't mean that you should do it. Does it meet God's word and the requirements in his word? And that is the main idea here. He's saying having a good conscience. So how do you have a good conscience? Be in God's word, focus on God's word, and follow God's word, and you will find a good conscience. But your conscience is not enough to protect you unless you are keeping it properly maintained. You know that speedometer on your car? You know if you get larger tires, it doesn't work right anymore? If you get larger tires, it'll say you're going the speed limit and you're actually going like 10 miles an hour over. Did you know that? Therefore, what do you have to do with your car? You have to maintain it. Keep it the right place. Make sure that it's actually telling you what's true. How many of you have ever had a gas gauge that doesn't work? Aren't those awesome? Right? My truck is like that. One day it'll show full, and the next day it'll show empty, and I've only gone 13 miles on the odometer. So we, we came to a place where we don't use the gas gauge on the truck anymore. To replace, you have to replace the whole fuel pump. Forget that. So what do we do? We hit that trip button reset every time. We know we can go 358 miles before you have to really run out of gas. So around 3.30, we fill up the tank. Doesn't matter if it's reading full or empty. That's your conscience right there. It can lie to you. And unless you've maintained it properly, it is a liar. Don't trust it. But God's word, God's word is not a liar. So maintain your focus in God's word. What's going to happen if you do these things? If you have a passion for goodness, a willing to suffer for wrong or right, a devotion to Christ, a readiness to defend your faith, and a pure conscience, then when trials come and suffering comes, you're set. You're not moved. You're not, you're not running away. Or your life isn't falling apart because of these things, but you're following after Jesus Christ. So I want to challenge you tonight. Focus on Jesus. Focus on his word. And prepare your heart for what's to come. Now, I love, and I'm going to end with this in verse 17. It's better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good rather than for doing evil. I love this. Not all of you are going to have to suffer in the same way. Isn't that awesome? Some people are going to have to suffer with their lives and give their lives up for Jesus. Some people are going to have to lose everything for Jesus Christ. Jonah didn't have to really lose anything. He was given everything, right? Great ministry, great opportunity, even transportation. Jeremiah, on the other hand, lost what? Everything. Elijah, well, he got everything. If you think about it, he could call down fire from heaven. Hey, I'm hungry. Hey, I got food for you. Why? Because if he gets mad at you, he calls down fire from heaven. He had everything. In the, in the presence of trials, Elijah was able to overcome through the power of the Lord. In the presence of trials, Jeremiah was called to suffer. And in the presence of trials, Jonah was called to repent because Jonah created his own issues, didn't he? But when you look at these different people in the Word, what do you find? You find that each one, to each one, was measured out a different measure. Not all of you are going to suffer in the same way. Not all of you are going to have to face the same difficulties in life. And I thank the Lord for that. I pray that you don't have to go through this. And I don't believe that we should be saying that all of you are going to suffer and America is going to suffer and I'm not here to do that tonight. I'm here to say prepare yourself for whatever comes towards you. 
If God has called you to suffer, then greet it with open arms and a, and a joyful heart. And if he has called you not to suffer, thank him with a joyful heart. But either way, prepare yourself. Be ready for what he has for you and watch God do something amazing in you. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we thank you for this time in your word. Lord, we thank you that you've given us your word that we would be prepared for those things that come. And that when the suffering comes, Lord, that our joy would be so remarkable to the world that they would want to know what's wrong. We ask us, Lord, that they would be given the gospel message. So as we come before you tonight, we pray that you would guide us and protect us, fill us with your Holy Spirit tonight, and use us in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen.